Have you ever been a part of an event where you were just mildly interested, but other people were insanely committed? Like, if you've ever been to a football game or a basketball game or a sporting event where, where you, you just went because a friend invited you, but then there are insane people all around you. I understood it in high school a bit, in college, but I was never like this. I, I never understood the guys who show up in Green Bay without shirts on, painted green and yellow, and they're in their 40s. And these are men who should not be shirtless. I'm not talking about washboard stomach, look at me, look how hard I work. I'm talking about men who should not just be wearing shirts, but tents. And, but there they are. They're going insane. I've wondered to myself, who are they married to? Like, what, you know, what, what kind of life does their wife have? And, or their kids, but then there are their kids with their shirts off, screaming and doing the same thing together. And, and you see that. And I've been to a Raider game, just one. You don't need to go to two. I mean, Raider fans are insane in the parking lot. The whole world changes. You just feel like you're in this land of Vikings and raiders and, and criminal elements. And, and, and some of that is not just an observation, but it, it's, it's, it's a practice of fandom because the word fan comes from that word fanatics. But it's not just true in, in sports. It's, it's true even in the political world. I mean, when you watch the, the Republican National Convention, you see people just insane, just clapping, cheering, crying, sweating, I think, wow, these people are like, they're, 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 their whole life has been given to this. And, and, and then you watch the Democratic National Convention, same thing. I mean, people are just screaming and shouting, wearing weird hats and, and crying, crying when they're hearing speakers. And, and, and I'm just sort of watching, but I'm realizing these people are fanatically committed to something so deeply that they, they feel it viscerally. And while you may not agree with what people are fanatically connected to, you have to in some ways appreciate that, that there's something in their life that matters so much to them that it consumes them completely. And I find that sometimes people from the outside observing in to religious spaces, they are very concerned with the fanaticism where you become a fan and you become fanatical and it consumes you in all the wrong ways. But there is something profound about us as human beings. When we don't do something out of obligation or expectation, but we do it out of an intense commitment and a driving belief that what we're doing matters. And what I, I really want to focus on just for a few moments today is this one particular moment in the scriptures where, where the people of Israel, going all the way back to Exodus, where they shifted from, in a sense, doing what they were told and doing what was expected of them to now doing far above and beyond what anyone asked because it was coming from their essence. Because there's a shift inside of us when we do things from the outside in and then we do them from the inside out. And I want to talk for a few moments about living in a state of overflow where you're bringing to the world what can only be generated when you become truly absorbed and committed to something bigger than yourself. I want to read from the book of Exodus, chapter 36, verses 1 through 7. It says, so Bezalel, Aholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord had commanded. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They, they received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring freewill offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all of the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing. They said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because what they had already brought was more than enough to do all 
the word. Now, remember the context of this is this is the beginning, in a sense, of Israel's story. They lived for generations as slaves to the Egyptians. And then God intervenes by sending Moses, who was raised among the Egyptians, then disappears for 40 years, then comes back on the scene, speaking on God's behalf to the Pharaoh to let his people go. And these people were the slaves, the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and as they set out, and you know the stories with the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, they didn't expect what was about to happen. Now they began wandering in the wilderness, in the desert for, for 40 years. And in those 40 years, there were many things that had to happen because it's one thing to be set free. It's another thing to learn how to be free. And so when they were set free, they still had the mindset of captivity. They didn't know how to think as free people. They didn't know how to choose as free people. They didn't know how to live as free people. They only knew how to live as slaves. And so freedom was a commodity they had not yet learned how to experience or express. And on top of that, God was essentially an unknown. Whenever we read the scriptures, we assume everyone knew who God was. But you have to remember that in, in a very real sense, God was being reintroduced to his own people. And if you've ever met someone for the first time, you may like them, but you may not trust them. You may think they're impressive, but you're not really sure you're going to put your life in their hands. It's a huge part of this journey of this wandering was so that Israel could get to know God. They could understand who he was and that he was trustworthy and that he was good. And then it came to the time where Moses was instructing them to create a tabernacle, a, a, a mobile temple, a, a portable place where they would meet with God and God would meet with them. And this was a symbolic space because God was always with them. But it was their way of knowing that they were connected to the creator of the universe and, and they were to make this this tabernacle out of gold and silver and wood and cloth. And in the middle of this project, there was much more going on. And one of the things that is just an important reminder is that many times what we see is just a small expression of what is actually happening. God is moving in human history, but they don't understand where they fall in the spectrum of human history. They don't Understand that they are the big opening chapter of a story that's going to be written and told for thousands of years. All they know is that they're in this moment that they don't understand that's bigger than them. And so this tabernacle becomes a symbol that God is with them and that they are moving with God in concert through human history. But something very unique kind of happens in the midst of this. And this is what to me is like incredibly unusual. It's, it's an aberrant moment, and I think a human experience when it comes to religion. Because religion is really about constructing a system that you impose on people. It's about convincing people to do what you tell them is the right thing to do, so they might have a right result with God. And most of religion is shaped by, by the fuel of shame and guilt. It's, it's powered by fear. And yet this moment is a complete reversal of that. Something began to happen that wasn't motivated by fear. It wasn't motivated by shame. It wasn't motivated by guilt. It wasn't motivated by any outside factors, but something changed from the inside out. And by the way, that for me became one of the, the most significant proofs I had that God was real. Because when I finally opened up my life to God and entrusted my life to him, I was actually surprised by what happened inside of me. Other people were watching what happened outside of me. They would either be impressed or unimpressed by my actions. They would be impressed or unimpressed by the external expression of who I was, but that's not what was really convincing me there was a God. Because I think anyone can be trained or train themselves to act good, even do good. But there's something different about wanting good. What really surprised me is who I wanted to be, not, not who I was choosing to be. I, I think a lot of times there are a lot of people who do good things for all the wrong reasons. 
And sometimes when you're envious of someone else who's living a destructive life, it's just because you didn't have the courage to live that destructive life. I think a lot of times it's our social constraints that make us look good rather than our internal drive and motivation. What surprised me after I came to know Jesus was that I actually wanted to be a better human being. I wanted to be good. When no one was watching, when no one was looking, when, when there were no expectations, when there was no real potential consequence, I wanted to be different. I wanted to have integrity. I wanted to be a person of truth. I wanted to be trustworthy. I wanted to make the world better. And for me, that was the most shocking and undeniable proof of God, that something changed inside of me. It's as if my internal compass flipped from south to north. But now the magnetic pull was not from the outside in, but from the inside out. This is what you find in this moment. You find people who begin to live in an overflow that was unexpected. But I want you to see with me that the beginning point is an overflow of desire. There's one word here that is so important. It's in verse 2. It says, Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and was willing to come and do the work. That word willing is one of the most important words you will ever read in the scriptures. This is the differential. It's so subtle you could actually miss it because so oftentimes what we're affected by is the outcome. We see what happens and we go, wow, we want that to happen. We see the outcome, we go, we want that kind of outcome. But we don't actually notice the nuance of the motivation, of the intention, of the internal shift of the people. They only looked for those who were willing. They didn't try to coerce anyone. They didn't try to obligate anyone. They didn't try to force anyone. I mean, how many of us haven't been in environments where we felt imposed upon? We felt people were trying to force us to be something or do something. I mean, how many of us haven't felt that outside push of guilt or shame or whatever it may be that sometimes even caused us to do something we didn't want to do just because the force of that external pressure was more than our own self-will? And here, what we find is that whenever God is moving in history, and I do want you to notice that God was actually at work. There's, there's this wonderful phrase, they were willing to come to do the work. The work was a work that God was doing. And this is an important backdrop reminder. In all of human history, there has never been a moment where God was not at work. In all of human history, there has never been a place where God was not at work. In all of human history, there has never been a person where God was not at work. Some of us resist that work. Some of us war against that work. But God is always working toward bringing you into the best version of you, even when you don't want to be that person. God is always working in history. So what we find is that there is this tangible, concrete expression of God's work, this tabernacle that they could see and touch and feel and they could build with their own hands but that tabernacle wasn't actually what God was doing God was doing something bigger in human history but that tabernacle was a physical manifestation of the invisible reality that God was working in history to call all of humanity to himself God is always at work and the question is not is God working but are you working with God are you aware of what God is doing in the world? And are you a participant in that? I try to remind myself all the time, I know God is doing something. I know God is doing something. I need to be able to see it so that I can move in that direction because I want to be in the middle of that. I'm not asking God to come and find employment in my life. God, come work in my life. I want to find where God is working and employ myself to that work. I think a lot of us are so self-centered even in our spirituality that we think God should move toward us and go in the direction we want to go rather than us moving toward God and moving in the direction he is going. But this is who God works with. God works with the willing. 
If you ever wondered, God, why don't you choose me? Or God, why haven't you picked me? Or God, will you pick me? Or God, I want to be a part of what you're doing. You are never disqualified from having too little talent. You're never disqualified for not being smart enough. You're never disqualified for not having enough experience. You're never disqualified by any measure that people ever choose. The one disqualification is that you aren't willing. And I, I, I think for me this is the most important and significant reason I can actually be a person of faith and stand here. I would never want to be a part of anything that tried to coerce or force people to become something they did not want to be or to do something they did not want to do. The entire movement of God throughout human history is simply to extend an invitation to each one of us, to extend an invitation to all of humanity and to look for the person who's willing. He's not even waiting for you to stand up and go, I can do this, God. I got this. See, because that might actually hold you back because if you see how big the challenge is that God's inviting you to, you might feel like you're not good enough and not big enough and that you don't got it. All God wants from you is, I am willing. And when you stand up and say to God, God, I don't know if I'm qualified. I don't know if I'm talented enough. I don't know if I'm intelligent enough. I don't know if I'm gifted enough, but I am willing. That's when God sees you and he invites you into his intention and purpose in the world. God is looking for those who have an overflow of desire. And maybe it's, it's the stage that I'm in in my own life. Maybe it's just turning 66, but I'm looking at the future going, I do not want our past to be more significant than our future. And I don't think we're finished yet, even as a community. I'm not sure all the reasons why, but the word church is a hard word for me. It, it, you rarely hear me say the word church because it feels so churchy. <laughs> it's easier for me to say mosaic than it is for me to say church. In fact, that's why I didn't put church on the name. It's not mosaic church, just mosaic. But people always add church. I go, take it off. Because Mosaic Church is in our name. Mosaic is our name. Church is who we are. It's a little different. But church wasn't my idea, so I can't eliminate it. It wasn't your idea. It wasn't a religion's idea. It was Jesus' idea. And it was the word he used to describe who we would become as we move together with his intention throughout human history. The church is our reminder that God is always at work. It's the, the visible manifestation like the temple or the tabernacle was that God is working in human history for humanity. And God isn't finished with us. I'm so convinced of this that, that, that there's a future that we can create together, but the only people who can really go there with us are the willing. And so if you're not willing yet, we're so glad you're here. And, and that's a great first step, just to be willing to show up, to be willing to be open, to be willing to grow. But there's some of you that you're, you're far past that. You, you're, you are in an overflow of desire. You're like, God, I am so willing that I do not want to miss out on what you have for me. God, I'm willing. I volunteer. I want to be a part of whatever you're doing in the world, God. And I can't shake that. I, I'm not here out of obligation. I, Frankly, let me tell you something that happens when you're in your 60s. You don't care. You, some, you're just so free. You don't care about other people's opinions. You don't care about what they say about you. You don't care about whether you're in the, the cool group. You don't care about anything. You just want to live the life that matters most. So I can tell you, I'm here because I'm overflowing with desire. I am among the willing. I want to be wherever God is moving most powerfully in the world. And I want to be in the epicenter of that. And I'm looking for you if you're the same. Because God is always looking for the willing. And the willing will always overwhelm the talented. You'll get more from the willing than you will from the intelligent, from the talented, from the gifted. Because that desire, that passion, that drive will sustain you in the hard times. In this moment, there is a simple invitation to everyone who is willing to come. We're just getting started. We have our campuses here in LA. We have our campuses in Mexico City and 
Quito, Ecuador, and in London, England, and, and we have not subsided in some of our dreams. Because when we came to LA, and it's funny when you have adult children, they ask you adult questions. And they'll say, Dad, you could have like, had more visible success somewhere easier. You know LA was like hard. Hollywood is hard. I said, yeah, I pretty much looked at the world and I thought, where is it hardest? I thought, I'll pick there. But you know, you don't have to always pick the hardest place. I kind of do. It's not that I'm, I'm masochistic and trying to bring pain. It's that I made a, a commitment to God when I was really young, well, in my 20s. I said, God, I want to do whatever no one else will do or what no one else can do. And so our dream was that Mosaic would be the community that would commit itself to reach the outlier. That we would commit ourselves to reach those creatives and those artists and those innovators and those entrepreneurs and those outliers that have never had a real opportunity to hear the message of Jesus in a way that made sense to them and to experience the community of Jesus in a way that felt authentic and real to them. And there are so many great churches in the world, but, but I, I can tell you that there is virtually no community in the world like this one. I don't know a community that would have what we had on Easter Sunday when we did a, a survey and asked the people there, if you're an atheist, and you would say, I'm an atheist, but I'm open to God if he's out there. And over a thousand people at Mosaic said, I'm an atheist on Easter. See, we're the only church where atheists really go to church on Easter. And then all my friends who did believe in Jesus, they felt so uncomfortable because they'd never been outnumbered in church. But we made really conscious decisions to create a community where those of us who believed were the servants of those who did not. Where those of us who believed would sacrifice some of our comforts for those who did not yet believe. Where those of us who believe would make ourselves secondary. Don't, don't you just want some place where you're like primary? You know, I, I mean, I, 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 I was a Clipper fan for like 20 years, and we never had a home game, even at home. It, it would frustrate me. Every Clipper game, the other team had more fans. And when we played the Lakers, and it was a home game for us, the whole stadium would be Laker fans. And I, there were very few athletes that love away games, but Kobe Bryant was one of them. He was the only person who might have been able to make it as a Clipper. Because every game was an away game. See, I think what happens so many times is in the church, we just want a home game so bad. We want home court advantage. So we create the church, and it becomes a place that's perfect for those who believe. And so irrelevant and distressing and confusing for those who do not. And I, I'd like to propose that we spend the next 10 years creating communities, not just in LA and in London, but maybe in Tokyo and Paris and other places in the world where the outliers haven't had a chance to hear or be in a conversation about Jesus that makes sense to them. But we have to be the willing for that to happen. And there has to be an overflow of desire. We have to want that as much as we want to breathe. Because it's hard. But there's also an overflow of talent that I want you to notice. Right before that phrase, willing to come, in verse 2, it says, in fact, this phrase is there multiple times in just a few verses. In verse 1, it says, so Bezalel and Oholiab and every skilled person, that line's really important, and every skilled person whom the Lord had given skill and ability. And then in verse 2, he goes on again, and every skilled person to whom the Lord given ability and was willing to come do the work. And so this phrase is there multiple times. Every, every skilled person with the ability. Because what happens when there's an actual movement that is a truly spiritual movement, that is coming from the inside out, is that there's not just an overflow of desire, but there's an overflow of talent. And this phrase, in, in that all those who are skilled and are willing, I think this is the perfect combination that we call talent. It's a combination of skill and ability. 
If you only have ability without skill, it's potential. And if you only have ability without skill, it's lost potential. And what's interesting to me is that there's this combination of skill and ability. Now, ability is what you do not have control over. It's what you were born with. But skill is what you do have control over. It's what you discipline yourself to add to the matrix of who you are. I, I don't remember who it was, and I'm kind of glad because when I saw this quote, they were way more famous and more important and more intelligent than me. So I'm not going to tell you who said it, but someone wrote, whenever you create a work of art, whenever you accomplish something successfully, it's 90% it's God and 10% you. And when I read that, I thought, no, that's just wrong. I, I, I know you should be so humble to say, it's 10% me and 90% God. Or is that still arrogant? Should you just say it's 1% me and 99% God? And some people go as far as to go, it wasn't me at all. I just was standing here. All right? It's, it was 100% God. And I'll have people say to me, I loved your book. Thank you for writing it. But we know you didn't write it. God wrote it. I'm like, God did not write the seven frequencies of communication. I'm telling you. He wrote Leviticus, but he did not write the seven frequencies, all right? And there are typos, and, and I just know that if God wrote it, there would be no typos. And, and by the way, if God wrote it, it'd be a way better book, just way better book and, and a global bestseller. But isn't it odd that we, we would consider it arrogant to say, I wrote the book? You're not supposed to say that, Right? I actually think it's more arrogant to say, God wrote my book. Because then I'm confusing me with God. See, I don't think it's 10% us and 90% God. In fact, when Jesus walked among us, was he 10% human and 90% God? Or was he fully God and fully man? Was he 100% human and 100% God. See, I think that's the way life is supposed to be lived. 100% you and 100% God. And so when you create something, it should be 100% you. But you should be given 100% to God. And we get this confused, and I think there's a reason for that, is that we think we're somehow stealing from God if we say we did something. The reason it's 100% God, even when you don't believe in God, is that your abilities were placed in you through your genetic code. Your abilities are given to you by God. They're not something you earned or deserved. You didn't choose to be taller. You didn't choose the way that your brain is constructed. You're designed in a very unique way. And even though some of that is environmental and some of that is through the journey that you live, there's so much of who you are it was just infused into your genetic code. But then there's another part of you that has nothing to do with your genetic code. It has to do with your sweat. It has to do with your grit. It has to do with your hard work. It has to do with your discipline. Years and years ago, when I first moved to L.A., I was, I was helping out at um, church, and I walked through the auditorium, and I was kind of new to this community, and I heard someone in the band say, because someone messed up in the band and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I know that was bad. And the other person said, don't worry, bro. It's, it's for the Lord. And I heard that. Don't worry, bro. It's just for the Lord. And I stopped. And I knew it was not my conversation. But I came back, and I interjected myself into that conversation. Did I just hear you say that it doesn't have to be good because it's for the Lord? You go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just don't need that pressure on us. We, you know, it's for the Lord. It's just it's all about our hearts. They go, no, it's actually not. It's also about your skill. You may have a great heart, but if you have no skill, you're out of the band. It's that simple. See, I, I think somewhere along the way, we believed or we convinced ourselves or we were told that if it's for God, the standard doesn't matter. But I want you to see how many times it says here, God called out the people who were skilled. They were skilled and able, skilled 
and able, skilled and able. In fact, in Exodus 35, it talks about these very individuals, Bezalel and Aholiab, because they are the first people where the Bible talks about the Spirit of God coming into someone's life. The Holy Spirit infused into the individuals who were skilled and able and brought their talents to God. See, if we're going to be a part of a movement that reflects what God is doing in history, we need to have an overflow of desire, but we need to have an overflow of talent. This should be the place where the greatest teachers in the world emerge, the greatest thinkers in the world emerge, the greatest carpenters in the world emerge, the greatest philosophers in the world emerge, the greatest scientists in the world emerge, the greatest communicators in the world emerge. We should be the epicenter of an overflow of talent. And, and we have to destroy this idea that if it's for God, all that matters is how sincere you are rather than how committed you are. It should be 100% you, which means you need to work hard and take on discipline. By the way, have you ever thought to yourself, God, why did you choose them and not me? Or God, why didn't you pick me? Is it possible that he didn't pick you because you were not prepared? I mean, I could say, God, I want to be a world-renowned violin player. I want to be a violinist, if that's how you call it. I, I want to be the best in the world. Why won't you do that for me? Why won't you give me that dream? See, I think that God would say to me, Irwin, you've never picked up a violin. You've never practiced. If you don't practice, don't ask me for greatness. If you don't put in the work, don't ask me to change the outcome. When God moves in history, there is an overflow of talent. Because when there's an overflow of desire, you want to please God by being the best version of you. What does the best version of you look like? Maybe you could become the best in the world. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know your, your talent capacity. So I'm not saying you should be the best in the world. I am saying you must become the best version of you. That's the measure of your life. And if you are willing to settle for a secondary expression of you, you've missed out on God's intention for your life. God has always looked for men and women who were willing to bring their best so he could do what they could not do even within their talent. I have a lot of friends who are incredibly competitive, always talking about who's the best in this or best in that. And I actually have friends who are like global speakers all in the business world who always talk about who's the best communicator in the world. I realize the reason they're so good is that they are so competitive. They're always measuring against each other and always assuming that they are the best. And what I walk away with each time is, don't say you're the best. Just be the best. Force them to say it. Be the measure. Be the standard. Be better. Push yourself. I know it's not really popular right now to say, that life is worth working hard. It seems like right now the ebb and flow is just chill. Like, you, you know, you guys have brought all this dysfunction of work and determination and ambition. And yeah, I am ambitious. I am determined. I have a, a vision of what it looks like to be the best version of me. And I will die trying to achieve that level of who I am. How about you? Are you going to wake up in the morning satisfied with where you're at? Even if you're better than everyone else, are you still going to be satisfied with you? I'm not talking about trying to earn love by what you accomplish. I'm talking about accomplishing out of a deep love. Because when you fall in love, you can never have enough of growing and developing.
The Bible says that, and it's probably one of the most quoted verses, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And we always focus on he'll give you. God, give me the desires of my heart. But we don't realize the first half and it says delight yourself in the Lord. Loving God changes your desires. And what God wants to do before he gives you your desires is change your desires so that they're desires you should actually want. Because some of the most painful experiences in our lives are when we get what we wanted and we should have never had. Oh, and there's one other overflow. The overflow of desire and the overflow of talent, but there's also the overflow of generosity. It's, it's kind of amazing what happens here. Let's go down verse 3. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning after morning after morning. And so all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing. And they said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. So in other words, all the workers who were building this tabernacle were getting interrupted by the generosity of all the people. They just wanted to bring more. They wanted to bring more. And they just kept showing up, bringing more and more. And the workers finally had to say, enough is enough. We cannot have so much generosity. They went to Moses. you got to solve this problem. People are not, are not hoarding. People are not holding. People are actually giving and giving and giving. Moses, you, you've unlocked the generosity in people that's slowing us down. Then Moses gave an order in verse 6, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. Can you believe that? Moses actually had to send out a decree. No one, not, not, no man, no woman is to make anything else as an offering to the sanctuary. By the way, I am not saying that here. But I want to say it here. Wouldn't it be amazing if we got to the place where we were so generous? We wouldn't say stop giving, we would just start giving it somewhere else. It says then, and so the people were restrained. I love that word. They were restrained from bringing more. Most of us are being restrained in our giving. Can you imagine being restrained and giving more? Because what they had already was enough to do all the work. You know that God is doing something unique, something historic when no one has to coerce you to give, when no one has to try to create a feeling of obligation or guilt or shame, you just are unrestrained in your generosity. And I look at the future, and, and it's, it's just interesting when, when you meet together just with the real practical things of life. When you look at things like budgets and you think, oh, can we afford that storefront? See, I don't want us to be in conversations about how do we pay the rent. I want to be in conversations about how do we impact Japan? How do we impact Asia? How do we impact Africa? How do we take the unique expression of the church that Mosaic is across the world where people desperately need it? See, I, I want us to be the kind of community that is so overflowing in generosity that it overflows out of Los Angeles across the world. I want to have a Sunday where I get up and say, stop! You're way too generous! What's wrong with you? Are you out of your mind? You need to save some money for dinner. It's astonished me the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been raised for the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And it struck me, wow, people love their politics. I just have a feeling people love politics more than they love people. Because there's nothing you will ever do of greater significance than helping people know that they're created by a God who loves them. That their life has value and meaning that God has come for them, and his name is Jesus. I think sometimes we forget that God is working in human history, desperately trying to bring humanity to himself, that he did not consider the cost of his sacrifice on the cross to be too great to bring even one person into his love. What 
kind of generosity is that? I think our ambition, our model, our standard should be the generosity of God. If we're going to be a part of the future that God is creating, if we're going to have 10 years ahead that are greater than any 10 years behind, we need an overflow of desire, a movement of the willing. We need an overflow of talent where we are the epicenter of the best of the best of the best in the world. And we need an overflow of generosity. You know, when people ask me things like, is tithing still biblical? I know that moment that they ask that, there's no overflow of generosity in that one. If you're trying to figure out how to do less, you don't know the God who's always the God of more. When you connect to Jesus, you just want to do more. You want to love more and care more and serve more and give more. And it's Jesus who said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. I look at this moment in history and I realize this was a miraculous moment where God didn't have to obligate them to do more. He had to stop them. Because all they wanted to be was in the middle of what God was doing with everything they had. I want to invite you to that kind of future with me. Would you just bow your heads with me just for a moment? Just close your eyes. You might be here today and this is your first time and you're in an insider conversation. But I'm glad you're here. Because if you're here and you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus, I want you to understand everything we do is for you. Everything Jesus died for was his love for you. The church is created so that you would have a space where you could be loved and accepted and known and valued so that you could know that Jesus died for you and rose from the dead. And if you've never invited Jesus into your life, I want to invite you to take this moment to take that seismic step and cross the line of faith and put your life in Jesus' hands. It's really simple. It's just praying a prayer like this one. Jesus, I give you my life. That's where it starts. Just a simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. I want to invite you to join me in that prayer. If you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, just tell him now, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. If this is your prayer, I want you just to raise your hand real quick so I can see you and pray for you. Whether you're here or in Hollywood right now, just raise your hand and say, right now, I give Jesus my life. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anyone else? Jesus, I give you my life. Beautiful. Beautiful. Father, I thank you for these who in this moment have opened up their lives to you. I pray that you would wrap them up in your love and let them know they belong to you, that you will never leave them or forsake them, that today is the beginning of a new future with forgiveness and freedom. I pray, God, that even now as you set them free, that you would teach them how to live free. And we thank you and pray in your name, Jesus. Would you look up just for a moment? There's some of you who are here, and I just want to invite you into this moment with me. And every once in a while, you just had to have a moment of um, recalibration. I feel like I, I've had it. I can feel it happening inside of me. I'm actively in the middle of it, to be really honest with you. Uh, maybe that's why I shaved. Sometimes I'm very, like, I got to change something because something's changing. But um, I feel like there's something inside of me that's just moving to an overflow. And I want God to do extraordinary things in me. I want to have an overflow of desire and an overflow of talent and an overflow of generosity in me. Because I don't want to miss being in what God's doing in the world. And if you're here and you're saying, man, I want to live in that kind of overflow, 
I just want you to stand right now. I'm going to pray for you, but just think about it first. Take a deep breath first and go, God, I know whenever I ask for more, you're going to demand more of me. And so when you ask God for more, you're actually saying, God, I'm willing to give more of myself. And if that's you, I just want to pray for you in this moment because we don't oftentimes take time for these moments in our lives. And if not, you, you just stay seated and feel comfortable to where you're at because God will wait for you in the right timing. Father, I thank you for these individuals who in this moment want to live in an overflow. I pray, God, that you would first place them in overflow of desire and delight and love and passion for you and for life. The God, that they would be the willing, that you would never have to even ask them or command them because they just want to. That their life would be an overflow of their love for you. God, I pray there would be an overflow of talent, that they would take stewardship of their gifts and talents, of their intelligence, of their emotions, and that they would become the masters of their inner world so that they could place themselves at your feet, that they would have the determination and grit and discipline to do the hard work that prepares them for greatness for the moment you call them up and call them out. God, I pray there would be an overflow of generosity in them. That, God, they would never again ask, what's the, the least I can do or the least I can give? That, God, that you would move them to great generosity in their life. Generosity in every avenue of their existence. A generosity in forgiveness. A generosity in love. A generosity in kindness. A generosity, God, in integrity. A generosity in their giving. God, I pray that there be such generosity from those of us standing that we would be able to advance your mission across the world. I pray, God, that our generosity would touch the ends of the earth with your love. We thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just thank God for all that he's doing in our mess. David.